Well, today we're going to start a new series, and it's called Puzzled. How many of you guys have worked a puzzle one time or the other? I'm a deep person. See this one? They, only give me, they'll, they will only give me the ones that says for ages five. That's mine. I don't want all of these that's got 500 and 1,000 pieces. You know the ones with the little bitty pieces? We used to trick my sisters and all. When we would get them, I would always take a piece or two from another puzzle and put it in the box and take a couple pieces of that out and change it so they could never get the puzzle worked. But we're going to be talking about puzzled today. And in life, many times we are puzzled. And in life, things ain't always as they seem. They're, they aren't always as they seem. And how do you solve a puzzle today is going to be my question. Many of you have different ways. How many of y'all like games with your kids? Let me see your hands. Y'all ever get together and play games? We get together and play Monopoly and do puzzles and play spades and Old Maid and all kinds of stuff. We just like to have a good time playing. Well, how do we solve a puzzle this morning? If you're getting ready to solve one, uh, the first thing I do, I always get the edges out like this. And I'll always get the ones with the flat edges, and I'll put them on one part. Then I'll get some more with different colors, and I'll put the different colored ones someplace else. But it's important that I've got the box top, that I've always got the top so I know what I'm trying to do. I need the box top. I need each and every piece of the puzzle. In God's church, there's a bunch of different puzzles. Do y'all realize that? A bunch, bunch of different people. Bunch of different pieces that look different and act different, but they all go in the same box and they all get together and make the big picture. It takes each and every one of us, and all of us are a little different. All of us are a little quirky at times. And all of us have our opinions, and we all have it the way we like it. We like to do it our way many, many times. Well, when I'm starting out a puzzle, I just shared with you, I like to arrange things in different ways. And you might do yours differently, but again, I like these straight edges to put them around the corners. I'll get all that out. But the main thing, I always keep that puzzle right in front of me. Now, I'm not just doing this for a silly illustration. This puzzle, and our puzzle this morning, must be Jesus Christ. He is the box top. He's the top. He's the big picture that we look at he must be the top we can work and labor all day long but if we forget what the box top looks like we miss the mark many times in life we'll get all these puzzles together and we'll start working on them and we'll want to do what we're supposed to do and we'll start be doing we'll start doing the christian life and try to do what's right and have our families in church and raise our kids right and do all of that but we'll forget the outcome and how we're supposed to look and many times we'll get the wrong puzzle in our box y'all ever done that before the wrong things come into your life at the wrong times and maybe you'll think it's the right time but you'll still get some of the wrong pieces in there many times and it just don't fit many times i'll start working the puzzle and i'll say man this is just too hard i'm gonna go watch the football game as i was doing things last night I was reading a lot and doing a lot of different things, and I started to watch the ball game, but you know what? It came on too late. I usually go to sleep about 8.30, so I missed it. Who won? Somebody tell me. Who won last night? Anybody know? Panthers or Dolphins? Panthers won. Okay. See, I didn't get that far because, you know, you go to sleep at 8.30 at night. You don't, you don't get that far. But many times we know where we're going, but we forget how to get there. Many times we start working puzzles. But we get the wrong pieces in there. Our life today, it's like a puzzle. Some pieces come easy. Some come natural to us. And we're okay in some areas. Some of them come rough. And we're not sure to do what to do with the puzzles. I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You get thrown a curve in life. You've got your direction. You know where you're going. But you get a, you get a curve and you try to figure out, what am I going to do with this puzzle? And... How am I going to make this puzzle fit in my life for the big picture? You know what, folks? There's a lot of things that come in our life that are never going to fit. Not for God's divine purpose. Not for the picture that we have in front of us. Not to be who God created us to be. See, it's simple this morning. Many things in our life don't belong there. And we need to kind of toss them and get rid of them. 
Now, there's some things in our life we can toss them and we can get rid of and we're never going to make the complete picture. I don't know if you've ever been there, but I have many, many times. I want to look at first Corinthians, and we're going to shoot it up on the board, and if you would, please turn in your Bibles with me if you have that, or your phone, or whatever you've got with a Bible on it, but let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Now, pay attention to that, now is underlined, now, say now, now, right now, today, we see things imperfectly, that's all of us, in the scripture, that's what Paul was talking about. The folks seen things imperfectly. Now we see things imperfectly. Like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. We're going to be talking about the now, which is today. And we're going to be talking about the then, which is eternity. We're not designed solely for the nows. Do y'all know that yet? Have you figured that out yet? Everything on this earth really doesn't matter a lot because our ultimate goal is eternity, is heaven with Jesus. And eternity lasts forever. Now we see things imperfect, imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity all that i know now is partial and incomplete but then i will know everything completely just as god now knows me completely do you realize that god knows us completely that he designed us that he knows us Completely. There's nothing that we can hide from God. There's nothing that we can do to fool God. He knows who we are. He created us in His likeness and in His image. And He created us and He gave us free will. And I'll tell you guys many times, I wish He didn't give me so much free will. Because I make so many poor choices. How about you this morning? We make poor choices. But back to the now. We're going to be talking about the nows for just a minute. Now we see things imperfectly. This world is imperfect. This world is imperfect. We see things each and every day that's imperfect. There's many areas in our life that we have imperfections. The then portions of the scripture that we just shot up there that's up there is for eternity is what we're going to be talking about. And in life, maybe you're thinking of the nows. You're thinking, man, I've got the job of my dreams. I love it. Everything's so good. Maybe you lost your job. I got a phone call here a couple months ago. Young lady in the church, she lost her job. And there was some cuts at her job place, and she didn't know what she was going to do, and she lost her job. I'm sitting there going, man, that's bad. But I assured her and her mom, I'm sitting there going, you know what? God's got something better. Now, that's pretty easy for me to say because I was reading and praying right about then. But how about the young lady who just lost her job with a small child? It don't look too good right then, not in the now. See, now all we could think of is how I'm going to feed my child, how am I going to pay my rent, how am I going to pay my car payment. That's the nows that we see. That's the nows that we see. I assured him God's got something better in store in his timing, and I'm going to be praying for you. Well, I got a call this week. Guess what? She got a job better than she had before. And it's the one that she wanted. And it, Monday through Friday, get off a half a day on Friday and don't have to work weekends. So we give God the credit for that, right? Give him the credit, okay? But see, in the now, in the now when your boss says, we don't need you anymore, we're making job cuts, it don't look too good, does it? Not in the now. We see those things and we wonder what in the world are we going to do. We wonder what we're going to do. How about when you've got a wayward child that's turned their back on God and going the other way and you're a Bible-believing Christian and you've been praying for that child and you're just trusting God that he's going to take care of them and wrap his arms around them and take care of them and guide them and protect them and they just go the other way. Talked to a guy yesterday I was trying to witness to, and he says, you don't want to hear my opinion of church. I used to be Catholic, but I don't even do that anymore. And I'm sitting there going, okay. I'm sitting there going, I'll work on you. He wasn't really ready for me to work on right at that particular time. I could tell that. 
But what do we do when we're a parent and we think we've done all we can and that child goes the other way? All right, how about, how about the now when we have a financial loss or there's a downturn economy? Nobody knows what I'm talking about there, do we? Downturn economy and things kind of went south and they hadn't quite got back yet. We're looking at the nows and how in the world am I going to pay the high rising cost of health care and insurance and retire and all of that. We're looking at the nows and the nows, they distract us from the thens of what God's got in store for us when we get to heaven. Boy, the nows get rough sometimes, don't they? The nows. The nows get rough. How about when you've lost a loved one? Maybe you had a child that went before you did. I couldn't imagine any thing as bad as losing a child or a grandchild. You know, the way we do it, we're supposed to go before our kids and our grandkids, right? I could not imagine that. And in the now, it would be terrible, horrible. We had that experience here this year, and I talked to the mom who lost her daughter, and she said, that's okay, she just transferred residences. And I'm going, wow, how in the world did that mom say that? We had that happen this year. And I'm sitting there going, how did she do that? Wow, I'm the pastor. Would I have that much faith? I wish I'd be doing as good as she would. I'd probably be boo-hooing and crying and wallowing around in the floor because it's hard to see the then when you're in the now, when you're experiencing the loss, when you're in a health crisis and a doctor comes and says you got cancer and you're in stage four and you're probably not going to make it. Chances are mighty slim. Brings us in the now. When a door closes, that you thought was supposed to be open to you. Maybe it was in a marriage you thought was going to be for eternity, and it crashed, and it burned. That's tough in the now. How do we live in the now? Let's look at that. How do we live in the now? Trusting God for the then. How do we live in the now? Trusting God for the then. Is this hitting home with you guys yet? Boy, it is with me. We've been through some tough stuff in the last year, haven't we? This church body's been through some tough stuff. Our church family, our extended family, we've been through some tough stuff. How do we live in the now, trusting God for the then? Trusting God for the then. We live in the now, and then we trust Him for the then. Pieces of the puzzle. Let me go back to the puzzle for just a minute. As I was thinking about puzzles and looking at this, and there was a guy in the New Testament, and his name was John the Baptist, and he kind of forgot what the puzzle looked like. He would kind of forgot about eternity, and he's going through a difficult time. He was in jail, getting ready to be beheaded. He knew what was coming. He had pointed out to the king about him doing something he shouldn't have done, and he was imprisoned, and the king's wife was kind of ticked off, and he wanted his head, she wanted his head on a platter, and it eventually did happen. And, but in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 2 through 6, Matthew 11, 2 through 6, we're talking about John the Baptist here, the forerunner of Jesus. How many of y'all have heard of John the Baptist? Let me see your hands. John the Baptist went around baptizing everybody. He was God's appointed messenger to announce the arrival of Jesus. He was God's main man. He was a little different. He was out in the wilderness, out in the desert, and he dressed different, and he looked different, and he ate locusts and all kinds of stuff, and honey and locusts, and looked a little bit different than we do. If he walked into church today, you might go, man, that's a strange-looking character. And I don't know if I'm going to accept him or not. He don't look like me. Because, you know, we like people that look like us, right? We like people that look like us. But this John the Baptist, he looked different. But again, he was the forerunner for Jesus Christ. He was a preacher whose theme was repentance. Probably not very popular back then. He called attention to the king and told him where, what he needed to repent from, and he was thrown in jail, and later he was beheaded. His outcome wasn't real good. He was un uncompromising for the gospel. 
He didn't compromise in any area of his life. He went out and he would preach and he would teach and he would baptize thousands and he baptized Jesus himself. John the Baptist baptized Jesus. He was doing what God had called him to do. He had a hard time in life. He was a prophet. He was related. He was a distant relative of Jesus. His mother was Elizabeth, Jesus's Mother was Mary, and they were distant cousins. John the Baptist, again, the forerunner for Jesus, and he knew who Jesus was. He predicted the Messiah coming, but yet he's in the now. Say now. John's in the now right here. See, when John, who was in prison, he's in the now. He's in there locked up in this dirty prison for doing what God called him to do. God told him to go do all this stuff and preach with authority. Preach with conviction. Preach the message of repentance. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him. Look at this question. Now, he knew where he was. He's in prison. He knew Jesus is over here. But he has a question to ask. He said, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect somebody else? Should we expect somebody else? Now, we've already established that John knew that it was Jesus. He knew who he was, and he's a distant relative. And he asked him this. Then look, look what Jesus says. He replied, go back and report to John what you hear and what you see. What happened here? Now, this was pretty cool right here. The blind received what? Mm. The lame did what? And those who have leprosy, what? Are cleansed. The death what? Here. Here. The dead are? And the good news is what? To who? The poor. To everybody. See, this message of the gospel is for everybody. It's for everybody. And the Bible says, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus, who was who he said he was. He was the Messiah. John here is in prison. He's living in a now, and he's having a difficult time right about here. He's sitting here waiting to be executed. So his question is, Jesus, are you really you? I'd probably be going, Jesus, you remember me? <laughs> I was your main man. <laughs> How about coming and getting me? I'm going to get my head cut off. About that time, this evil chick, the king's wife, who I've been talking bad about, I called her out and told her she needed to repent and told the king he needed to repent. I know I'm going to be executed. Jesus, Messiah, hey, come get me. I've been in the now. Jesus, come get me. How about you? I'd wanted to get out of that place, you know. I wouldn't want to be beheaded the next day. I don't care if it's for the cause or whatever. I'm just speaking me. I know he was called to do it. But he had some questions when John, who was in prison, he heard about the deeds of the Messiah. He sent out the disciples and he said, are you the one that's come, or are we going to expect somebody else? And Jesus said, go back and tell everybody. Go back and tell John that I'm the man. I'm the one who has came. And I'm the one who's going to cleanse everybody. I'm the one who's going to forgive them of their sins and continue to preach till the very end. I'm healing people. I don't even care if it's on a Sunday. You know, Jesus actually healed people on Sunday. The nerve of him is what the Pharisees said. But Jesus was who he said he was. But John, right there, he was living in the now. But there's hope for John. He gets it. He gets it. He was in hardship. I read this morning, one of y'all sent it to me this morning, that said, this was by C.S. Lewis. Hardship often prepares an ordinary person for an extraordinary destiny. Let me read that again. Hardship often prepares an ordinary person for an extraordinary destiny. John the Baptist, he was going to be beheaded a few days later, but he was prepared. He knew he was going to heaven. So after he gets these words from Jesus, he's prepared to go meet God in heaven. He gets the assurance. Now we're living in the now, and it's hard to see the then. We're waiting for a breakthrough. We're, we're waiting to be healed. We're waiting for a spiritual breakthrough. Have you ever been at a dead end or a dry place in life? Maybe in your spiritual journey. 
You're going like, God, where are you at? I used to be hot-hearted for you, but now I'm down and out, and I'm dry. And I need the Holy Spirit to rain on me and fall fresh. You ever been there? Huh? See, we need God's Spirit each and every day to fall fresh on each and every one of us. This is an old illustration that I use, but we're just like a car. You're going down the road in your car, and there's a gas tank, and you fill it up, and it says full. Then it runs down to empty, correct? There's many of us in here this morning that's running on empty. A lot of us in here is running on a half a tank, three-quarters of a tank, but yet there's still some running on empty this morning because you've been doing life in the now, going like, oh, man, what's going to happen next? I know. Life's going to have trouble. Job told us that, but I'd like a little bit of relief. I think John the Baptist here, he wanted a little bit of relief. Probably didn't want to be executed a few days later. But again, he didn't get any. Hardship often prepares an ordinary person for an extraordinary destiny. See, I think when Jesus was speaking, he said, John... You don't have the box top. John the Baptist, he didn't have the box top. Y'all know that? He didn't know the total outcome. None of us do. None of us has the total box top. We're going to get it when we get to heaven. But we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus because he is the author and he is the perfecter of our faith. We've got to keep our eyes on the box top. Jesus is our box top this morning. Matthew 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 11 question did jesus get mad at john here did he get mad at him did he get mad no nah, he didn't get mad look what he says a few verses later he said truly i tell you among those born of women there has not risen anyone greater than john the baptist john the baptist remember a few verses back john saying jesus is it really you what a reply, I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. He didn't exclude him for that little bit of doubt that he had, a little bit of certainty, a little, little bit of uncertainty, or a little bit of questions that he wanted to ask Jesus. See, God is in here this morning, and he's big enough for your doubts. He's big enough for your issues and my issues and my doubts. Even when the enemy whispers you're no good or you failed and looked at marriage and you're disqualified. and Even when the enemy, say, oh, you, enemy says, oh, you probably aren't even saved anyway. The way you do if you were saved, you probably aren't even saved. Y'all ever heard that? Y'all ever had the devil tell you all these things? You ever had the devil tell you, oh, there is no God? That's kind of what this guy was telling me yesterday. His name was Mike. Oh, I don't even believe in anything is what he said. He used to be Catholic, but I don't even believe that no more. You don't want my opinion of religion, pastor. <laughs> I hear that all the time. People are living in the now. Folks, in the doubts of today, we must trust in his tomorrows, in the doubts of today. You know we're always going to have doubts of today, but we've got to trust in God's tomorrows We've got to realize that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. We was at a Bible study in here the other night. We had church, had the greatest turnout we've ever had. And getting together, I told y'all last week we was going to have food, so everybody showed up for the food. And we're going to be reading out of Mark. We started reading Mark chapter 1. I hope you're participating in that and reading the first five chapters by Wednesday, and we're going to discuss that this Wednesday. But in the doubts of today, we trust into the tomorrows. And why I'm throwing that in is we've got to be reading the Word and praying and seeking God. I told you all that last week. If we're not reading and praying each and every day, we start doubting. Things start happening. You start have troubles. You start having troubles. You start having trials in your life. You get a bad doctor's report. And you go, why me? But see, the Bible again tells us that we can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives us strength. That's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So regardless of what one physician says, the doctor over here, now the master physician, Jesus Christ said he can heal people. Do y'all believe that? Amen. Jesus can heal people. We hear it time and time again of Jesus healing 
people. In the doubts of today, we trust God for tomorrow. Our trust is in Him. It's in Him alone. It's in no other place. Jeremiah was familiar with this, and he knew this. And Jeremiah, in chapter 29, verse 11, he made a statement for him, and he made a statement for his entire family, kind of like what we was doing for our children this morning. See, the Bible says, for I know the plans I have for you, and this applies to us today, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Y'all read the last part with me. Plans to give you what now? Hope and a future. Hope. See, God brings us hope. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. The good news of the gospel is the hope of the world. We always have Jesus. That's where our hope should lie this morning. Jeremiah made that statement. He did not only make that statement for himself, but he said, as for who? Him and his house. He would serve the Lord. Do you remember that? He says, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. Now, our faith is in God, and it's also not in the outcome that we want or we expect. Many times we expect one outcome when we get another. Just like the job situation I was talking about. You can be situated in this job and think, you know, this is it. Don't get any better than that. Then you lose that job, and... You go, well, what in the world am I doing? You start having doubts and fears, and then God comes along five weeks later and says, hey, I got something better in store for you and your family. See, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. Our faith is in God and not in the outcome of the nows. Hebrews 11, known as the faith chapter. Hebrews 11, I didn't put that on the PowerPoint this morning, but Hebrews 11 says faith is the confidence that we will hope for will actually happen. I'm sorry, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. That's the then. You got me? God's always got something working on in the then. In the heavenly realm, he has something going on. And you might be sitting there going like, well, you know, I prayed for my grandmother or grandfather, and they died, and I don't know why they died, or I prayed for that person, and they weren't healed. Well, you know, we don't always understand the outcome on this earth, but God does. We need to be looking at the then and trust him. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9 says, Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. Wow. How many times do we try to convert God? Y'all ever try to do that? You want to do it your way? You ever done that? You want to do it your way? And you want to convert God and get him to come over your way. And it don't work. I've done that many times. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. When we're doing stuff that's not God's ways, he's not going to change his mind. And we're not going to convert him. Do y'all know that yet? Have you figured that out? What happens is there's many control freaks in life. And being in control is only an illusion anyway. Have y'all figured that one out yet? None of us are in control. God's in control. God is the box. He's the box top. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth. See, the heavens are what? Higher than the earth. So my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. Y'all believe that this morning? Yeah. His ways are better. They're higher than ours. We get caught up and we want it our way and we want to change God's mind and we come back to the old puzzle and we say, God, I want to make this fit. Well, uh, God, you know, I've tried it your way and I didn't really like it. This is the world according to Dan. 
and I'm going to make it work. I get one more cluster, and it won't go together, right? Is that just me? I'm always up front having to do this. Y'all are mighty quiet this morning. Y'all ever mess up? Y'all ever want it your way? Huh? You ever throw in your plans? God will give you a plan, and you just mess it all up. And you try to do it your way. And it don't work. And it don't work. I think Jesus, talking about Jesus, he got a bad piece of the puzzle. He really did. God sent his one and only son to come on, come on down on this earth to die for our sins. I think he kind of got the bum rap. You know, he didn't sin at all. Y'all remember that? One and only son of God didn't sin, but yet he was crucified for our sins. I think he got a bad piece of the puzzle because he had to die on the cross for somebody like me. I sure am not worthy of him dying on the cross for me. Jesus got a bad piece of the puzzle, and he got it because of me and because of all of us. He went to the cross and died for the sins of the whole world. The sins of the whole world. See, my frustration in life a lot of times is based on my knowledge and of me not knowing the box top and taking my eyes off of him and not realizing what all he's trying to do in my life. All of the troubles and the trials that I go through, he's trying to develop in me a godly character, godly spirit. Remove all of the impurities out of my heart and out of my life because y'all know heaven is a perfect place and we need to clean it up before we get there. Huh? Everything, he wants us to be holy and he wants us to be pleasing to him and he wants us to clean our lives up and be like him. He says in the scriptures, this is straight out of the scripture, God speaks to us and he says, be holy because I'm holy. Just some food for thought this morning. It gets us mighty quiet when we talk about stuff like that. We've got to watch what's going on in the sl slow moments and when we don't see a lot of activity going on and when we think we're really having it rough. We've got to see what God's trying to do in our lives and what kind of blemishes he's trying to take out of our lives and perfect us and make us better. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scoop of God's work from the beginning to the end. That's what's wrong with us today. We want instant gratification. We want to know the answers. We want to make sure that we see the box top, but we want to make sure that we're placing all of the pieces of the puzzle where we want them to be placed, and God saying no. Yet, God has made everything beautiful for its own time. The nows living here were in boot camp, were in training for eternity. He has planted eternity. See, what's wrong with us, folks, is he's planted eternity in our heart. So we're not going to be 100% happy this morning till we get to heaven. That's when we're going to be complete. That's when we get to heaven. How are we doing so far? Are we making progress? Huh? Are we making progress? But even so, people cannot see the whole scoop of God's work, scope of God's work from the beginning to the end. What's he doing in your life today? You know, each and every day we come in here and we're challenged Last week we said, read the Bible, pray every day. Do we do it? Last week I challenged you to try it five minutes. At small group, I challenged you for five minutes. Of Acts formula, adoration, confession. I'm sorry, adoration, thanksgiving. Adoration, A, confession, thanksgiving, then supplication. We need to pray each and every day. We need to seek his word, the Bible tells us that thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's, he's talking about a holy God. As we develop, uh, as we develop, we'll become better down the road. We prayed for these kids that went into kindergarten this morning. One of them's going to daycare, a couple of them. Then we've got some going into the second and third grade. Then we've got them going into the seventh and the eighth grade. If we was in the kindergarten learning stage of God from last week. From last year, we should be on grade one or two or three or maybe in high school. 
a year or two down the road, we need to be growing each and every day. Let's pray. Father God, today, help us all not to focus so much on the now that's going on in our lives. Help us today to focus on you. You tell us in the Bible that you are the author and finisher of our faith. You tell us that this world is not our home. You tell us in this world we will have troubles. That's a guarantee. It's an assurance from the Word of God. In this world, Jesus, you had troubles. In this world, Job had troubles. The Apostle Paul, John the Baptist, everybody before us had troubles while living on this earth. God, today, it's during times like this that you work in our hearts and you draw us back to you. Holy Spirit, just pull us back to you this morning. Where we have went the other way and where we forgot about our first love and where we've turned and went our own ways and we've tried to do it our way time and time again. Let us realize that you, want, you are the big picture. You are the big box. and Help us to focus on you. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning, if God's working in your heart right now and he's speaking to you through this message and you need him to come and just fall fresh in you, to give you a renewed spirit, to give you a renewed heart, maybe you've got some doubts, maybe you've got some uncertainties, but God is moving in your life today. Would you just slip up your hand so I can pray for you? Just slip up your hands so I can pray for you. God, today, amen, amen, amen. Senior, many, many hands. God, today, please, first of all, forgive us of doing things our way. Forgive us of turning from you. Forgive us, God, of our sins. God, today, give us a brand new start. Give us a brand new beginning. Empower us through your Holy Spirit to be the people that you've called us to be. Help us to quit focusing so much on the now and focus on the then. When we get to you, when we are in heaven and spend an eternity with you. God, em enable us, your body of believers, to be all we can be for you. I pray for your strength and your power. Holy Spirit, pour out your blessings. Pour out your spirit, your might, and your power on this congregation. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Amen.